Now much has been said about the German invasion of Poland. Popular memory remembers how the Luftwaffe blotted out the sun and the Poles fought valiantly in the shade. How the Panzer smashed the Polish army as Stuka struck forth from the heavens, trumpets blaring and how the world was about to go down, a path of destruction unprecedented in our history. Emotional narratives to the side, the German invasion of Poland is a fascinating case study of the Luftwaffe, which makes it so important to look at, because reality was very different to the myths that have been spun since that fateful day, September 1st, 1949. It was in Poland that the Luftwaffe had its baptism of fire, and established itself as a modern, tactically adept force that threw conventional wisdom out of the window and created something new, the Luftwaffe's way of war. But it was also in Poland that the cracks that would hound the Luftwaffe until its very last day were beginning to show. Reason enough to take a closer look, and that is exactly what we'll do right now. Now to do this, we have to quickly set the scene by contrasting the Polish and German Air Force, so you'll actually have an idea of the dispositions that we are talking about here. The Polish Air Force did not exist as a separate independent entity. Rather, both the Army and the Navy had their respective aerial component, although to do the relative sizes, we will look at the Army one only. While Poland had a plethora of recon aircraft, which shows how the Army's conservative doctrine regarded aviation, it was limited by only 300 fighters. An additional 150 light bombers filled the ranks, as well as 100 medium bombers. Except for the latter, the force was obsolete or becoming obsolescent. For a young force comprised entirely of homegrown designs, this size was nonetheless impressive considering it received only about 5-6% to of the army's budget. Now before we talk about the Luftwaffe, we should talk a little bit more about the organization of the Polish Air Force on the 1st of September 1939, the day the German army invades. Well, you have the Navy component which, like I mentioned, given its size isn't really that important, and then you have the army formations. But beyond that you have a third force that I haven't really touched upon just yet, but I will do so in just a second. Going back to the army, however, what essentially has happened is that Poland is fractured into different army districts, and each army district is under the command of an army commander. And each district and each army commander can draw upon a given number of aviation units directly under his command. Now a recent organization has in fact increased the number of these districts from 5 to 7 and this has left the Polish Air Force a little bit thinly spread. What it means on paper is that in 6 out of 7 of these districts the army commander can draw upon one fighter unit and three recon squadrons. And the last one, who do the short straw, can only draw upon the support of three recon squadrons. However, if you've been paying attention earlier, You'll notice we still haven't accounted for the light and medium bombers. Where did those go? And in fact, there are so many fighters still unaccounted for as well. What's going on? Well, this is where that third force that I haven't just mentioned just yet uh, comes into play. And this is the what is sometimes called or translated as the dispositional aviation force, or some authors also call it the strategic reserve. Now, essentially what this is, is a force that is quasi-independent and under the direct control of the commander-in-chief. And here are five fighter squadrons, which are or meant to be uh, centered around Warsaw, and four medium bomber squadrons and five light bomber squadrons. So that's where those remaining numbers went. Let's turn to the Luftwaffe. Now, no force is ever ready for the war it is supposed to fight, and the Luftwaffe, contrary to popular memory, was no exception. Of those aircraft going into Poland, the bomber force, comprised out of Heinkel 111 P and H variants, as well as Dornier 17s, was the most developed branch. Likewise, every single Stuka was put into the fight, reinforced by some older Henschel 123s. For the fighters, it was somewhat different. The Zerstörergeschwader, supposed to be flying the new B of 110s, were new and had yet to be fielded in number. And while the Jakish waters were supposed to be equipped with the brand new B of 109E models, the majority still flew the older D model or a mix thereof. Popular memory of the Poland campaign is centered around ground support and tactical strikes against the Polish army. But the Luftwaffe's plan to enter the war was very different. The objective was to strike bases to catch planes on the ground and destroy support facilities, thereby preventing the Polish Air Force from taking part in any effective air operations. Once attained, attention would be turned to supporting the two army groups and attacks against military installations and armament factories. Once the Luftwaffe had air superiority, the next target for the Air Force would be the military infrastructure and national railnet. 
Poland, a nation with few good roads and few vehicles, was almost completely dependent upon its railroads for moving and supplying its army. If the rail network were crippled, the Polish army would be unable to effectively respond to a rapid German advance. A lower priority for the Luftwaffe was providing direct close support for German forces engaged in the ground battle. As you might expect, this plan met some strong criticism from the army, who complained that this limited the amount of air support they would receive. So, the plan was altered to include immediate support to the army. Luftwaffe 1 would operate coastside, covering Army Group North, that's Heeresgruppe Nord, and Luftwaffe 4 would cover the main thrust by Army Group South, that's Heeresgruppe Süd. Yet, the majority of the fielded aircraft were in the north, with Luftwaffe 1, which fielded 1,100 machines. Luftwaffe 4 had around 700. An additional 310 recon aircraft were fielded, as well as a dedicated air defense force of around 100 fighters. Units not attached to either air fleet also took part in the operation, such as the training squadrons operating JU-52s. This means that the majority of the Luftwaffe's operational strength ascend due east. In fact, the Luftwaffe sends every single JU-87 Stuka dive bomber that it has, 370-odd aircraft, and reserves them for the invasion. Uh, as well as that, roughly uh, 70 to 80 percent of the bomber force is being uh, sent east to reserve them for the invasion of Poland. And only really a small reserve of the Luftwaffe is kept in the west to cover that flank from the French and potentially the Brits. Now, as you might imagine, this massive relocation, which only really started two months before the invasion, created somewhat of a minor logistical crisis. It's not just sending the aircraft there and the ground crews and the pilots, but you have to prepare the force for the invasion. And one of the things that the Luftwaffe had to do is build new airstrips. And 155 airstrips, most of them provisional, were established and laid out during this time. And in, so much material was sent from the force that was mainly concentrated in the west to the east of Germany that the Luftwaffe had essentially to draw upon the civilian reserves and the civilian capacity of Lufthansa, the German air carrier, uh, to pretty much pull this off. Now, when 1st of the September dawned and the Luftwaffe sent its aircraft towards Poland, only roughly 50% of its force managed to take off. And uh, this, of course, was mainly due to the weather. However, the Luftwaffe had done substantial recon to this time, sometimes pretty much overt and sometimes covert, over the last couple of months. And in fact, it had violated Polish airspace quite a lot of times and had had taken pictures of pretty much everything it could find. And this means that pretty much for the first and perhaps arguably for the only time ever in its history that the Luftwaffe possess superior and excellent knowledge of the disposition of the Air Force, its adversary's Air Force. And it's also pretty much the first time and pretty much the only time that it openly overestimates the enemy force instead of underestimating it. In line with its innovative tactical doctrine, the Luftwaffe and Army were meant to closely coordinate their strikes. To maintain close contact with Army units it was to support, the Air Force detailed liaison officers to the major ground commands. A Luftwaffe commander for all air reconnaissance and flak units supporting the Army was also detailed to each of the two Army Group headquarters. However, the actual cooperation and communication between ground elements, especially between the mobile Panzers and Stukas, was more static than fluid. And this was even though the about half of the Stukas employed were tasked with specific close air support missions. But with few realistic means of unit identification from 3000 or 4000 meter up, and no radio communication yet established, close air support missions were risky. To give their pilots more clarity on what could be bombed and what not, rules were established. Luftwaffe and Army commanders would determine a bomb line along the Army front and forbid the Luftwaffe to bomb short of the line unless the circumstances were exceptional or in the case of a carefully planned attack upon a clearly identifiable enemy target. Yet occasional friendly fire was still a thing, especially when the Army overran the bomb line and couldn't communicate this to the Luftwaffe in time. However, the bomb line also had another result. Essentially giving their units clearance to attack any target beyond it, German pilots would sometimes hit targets of limited military value, or even civilians. There is much debate on how much of this was premeditated or not, but it did happen. What is clear, however, is that the Luftwaffe did indeed specifically target Polish cities, chief among which was Warsaw, with their bombers, hoping to break public morale. 
Direktive Nummer 20 ist ein Targets to Northern Warsaw to Luftwaffe 1 and those to the West and South to Luftwaffe 4. Von Richthofen's preparations were hampered by OBDL restrictions. The Heinke 111 Kampfgeschwader he requested was replaced by JU-52 transports. The air and artillery bombardment began on the 23rd of September. The full horror came when the weather cleared two days later on what the Poles came to call Black Monday. From 0800 hours onwards, a force of some 400 bombers of the 1150 sorties, sweating airmen literally shoveling out incendiary bombs from the open doors of JU-52s, a method described by Speidel as worse than primitive. The bombing of Warsaw on the 8th, 13th and the 25th of September caused international outrage. The international press reported the number of casualties from the aerial attacks on Warsaw as between 20,000 and 40,000 dead, and that one attack had destroyed more than 10% of the buildings in the city, and such figures remained in the history books over 60 years later. In reality, sober analysis has to place the casualties and damage at a far lower level. If Warsaw's casualty rates were equal to the most lethal bombing rates of World War II in Germany, then the casualty rates would be between 6,000 and 7,000 dead. Regardless of the body count, this attack was a deliberate terror bombing meant to break Polish morale and determination. As with all terror bombings, it did the exact opposite in the long run, but the sensationalism surrounding it played right into the hands of the Germans. Another irony is that the sensational tone of the press coverage in the Western nation did nothing to help the Polish cause, but instead served the Nazi cause wonderfully. The international press represented the basically false image of the Luftwaffe as a force that could level whole cities and kill tens of thousands instantaneously, a capability way beyond the Luftwaffe powers in 1939-1940. Going back to the Army Luftwaffe communication, we can see that not everything went according to plan, with the Luftwaffe often confused as to what units were where and when. This resulted in several setbacks. For example, on the 8th of September, Stukas destroyed a key bridge just as the 1st Panzer Division was gearing up to cross it. As you can imagine, the Panzers had a few choice words to say about that incident. In a preview of what was to come in Luftwaffe operations, Chief of Staff General Jeschonek gave vacillating and contradictory operational orders, often directly to units without informing the air fleet commanders. One Luftwaffe officer with limited patience took matters into his own hands. On the third day of the campaign, von Richthofen's most common complaint was a lack of clear information as to the location of the 10th Army units. The Luftwaffe officers attached to the Army and possessing their own reconnaissance aircraft were no more helpful than the Army in providing clear information on German or Polish troop dispositions. Finally, he took to flying around the battlefield himself in a Fiesler Storch and he carried out personal coordination with General von Reichenau and the 10th Army headquarters on an almost daily basis. Von Richthofen's actions fall very much in the line of the typical image of a German general, a man personally engaged with the war, directing it from the front line, or, well, in this case, a small, lightweight aircraft. Yet, this also speaks volumes about what the German army still had to learn, namely tighter and more coordinated communication between the different branches that had yet to have direct radio communication between them, to really capitalize on its innovative tactical doctrine. The cumbersome system might have worked more smoothly had there been a common radio frequency between the two services. Not only was this lacking, but the Luftwaffe's communication system itself was brought to a verge of collapse. Each Flieger Division had a telephone company, five liaison platoons and two radio aircraft, reinforced by telephone and teleprinter units, and the system was supposed to expand at a rate of 7 km a day. However, the Panzer divisions were advancing 40 km a day. Landline communications failed completely, while radio messages were taking three hours to get through. Now if you want to know more about this and the cooperation between Panzers and Stukas, check out this video by my body military history visualized. But there was another, perhaps not immediately a serious issue, but one that would have massive repercussions down the line. Logistics were another serious problem for the Luftwaffe in Poland. As the 10th Army drove rapidly forward, the short-range Stuka and fighter units of the Special Air Division needed to deploy forward in order to provide effective support to the Army and to maintain the high sortie rate. The 4th Air Fleet allocated one JU-52 transport group to support both General Reichenau and von Richthofen, and by the 3rd of September the transports were already being used to fly fuel forward to keep up the momentum of the advance. At the same time, von Richthofen began to move his short-range Dukas and fighter units forward to former Polish airfields and he needed all the air transports he could get to keep his planes supplied with fuel and bombs. Maintaining a high sortie count was paramount to the Luftwaffe, but without fuel, no plane will fly. 
By the 8th of September, von Richthofen complained to this air fleet commander, General Lohr, that his supplies of fuel and munitions were so low that he would have to reduce his sorties. Shortages were so acute that on 11th of September, von Richthofen reduced the sortie rate for some of his Stukas and fighter groups to one sortie per day. The problem was eased on the 13th of September when the Luftwaffe allocated two additional Ju-52 squadrons to support the 4th Air Fleet. Overall, the main problem with the German strategy was that there was a lack of an infrastructure dedicated to transportation and logistics, with a structure designed around this task. One can point to the transport gruppen of Ju-52s, but these were not in fact dedicated logistical transporters, but used in a variety of roles from transportation to liaison to bombing and airborne operations. In Poland, the problem was limited due to German air superiority, the low attrition rates among the logistical core and the relatively short distances. Here, the system could be stretched to its limits or even beyond that for a short time, but to sustain such an effort over a longer duration in a more perilous environment was unrealistic. That the Germans never put more thought into such scenarios was perhaps one of their major mistakes in the war, with the tragedy compounded by the fact that it was already visible from day one. And not just figuratively, but literally. To see one example of how this ended up, check out this video on the disastrous Luftwaffe operation in Tunisia. But how were things on the other side? While Poland fielded a smaller air force, they didn't exactly go into this war unprepared. Knowing the attack was coming, they essentially had two choices. They could either keep the air force bunched on a few key airfields, thus allowing for a potentially stronger defense of an area, or they could spread their aircraft out to smaller bases, thus preventing their destruction in a single savage blow. It was a no-win scenario, and for better or worse, the Poles chose the latter. This measure, and with some luck with the weather, allowed the Polish air force to survive, at least for now. Despite the onslaught, the Polish air force remained largely intact and was not destroyed on the ground during initial attacks. The Luftwaffe faced several difficulties in its effort to destroy the Polish air force. The weather on September 1st was very poor, allowing only one third of the effective force to take off. More importantly, although the Luftwaffe attacked 9 of the 12 main airfields, only Warsaw had a sizable number of planes. 19 secondary fields were attacked with little success. You got to remember that the Poles were playing for time. No one doubted that Germany would eventually win if Poland stood alone, but many expected Britain and France to intervene and come actively to Poland's aid. So when the dice were thrown, the Poles opted to pull their air force back instead of going out in a blaze of glory over Warsaw. However, this dispersal came at a price. While the Luftwaffe's first mission only destroyed training, recon and liaison aircraft, the Polish Air Force had few reserve and the relocation had decentralized it from its supply stores and established command and communication structure. It survived the first assault, but its own striking potential had also been affected. The result was that the Polish Air Force became an ever more disjointed affair, suffering enormously by attrition as spare parts became rarer each day. As well as that, with little communication between the army and its air assets, any attempt to coordinate actions became impossible. Polish recon aircraft stood very little chance considering German air superiority and the Polish bomber force was used conservatively and was too limited in number to do much. The limited missions flown also resulted in many friendly fire incidents as Polish AA, accustomed to frequent German attacks, opened up on any flying machine it saw. But when it came to the fighters, the Poles had actually remarkable success considering the circumstances. Although flying outdated models with limited performance even over some of the slower German machines, the pilots were able to capitalize on the strengths of their aircraft, forcing the Germans into low-speed engagements when possible, or launching reckless but effective attacks against Stukas and bombers, although ultimately the Poles stood no chance. Valiant effort or not, the German army overwhelmed the Poles and the Luftwaffe did many things right. Its way of war, that of rapid, overwhelming strikes paired with a swift ground assault, paid dividends. Likewise, air superiority and the constant chaos and pressure applied to Polish units in the hinterland robbed them of respite, keeping the initiative cleanly in the hands of the Germans. This combination of close air support and interdiction was the Luftwaffe's way of war, and it was effective. 
The effectiveness of the Luftwaffe's doctrine in supporting a war of maneuver was demonstrated in Poland. The Luftwaffe's creation of a large mobile logistics force enabled the Luftwaffe's units to move into Polish airfields right after the army overran them and to fly army support missions with their fighters, Stukas and reconnaissance aircraft from rough airfields directly behind German lines. This gave the Luftwaffe a high combat sortie rate of 3 plus missions per day. The movement of large air units such as von Richthofen's had been practiced extensively in peacetime maneuvers and it came off without a hitch. It was a logistics and planning feat that no other air force in the world could have carried out in 1949. By September 7, the Luftwaffe focus shifted on more tactical support for the army. This applies specifically to the Stukas under the command of von Richthofen. From 7 to the 12th of September, von Richthofen's forces helped decimate Polish forces in the Radom Deblin area. From the 13th to the 17th of September, von Richthofen used his entire force to support von Reichenau's 10th army by reducing Polish defenses and troop concentrations on the Bizura. On 26 and 27 September 1939, von Richthofen attacked Modlin with 1000 aircraft sorties. On the threat of further air assault, Modlin surrendered without any ground assault. So while victorious and ushering in a new era in aviation doctrine, the Luftwaffe's initial attempt to knock out the Polish Air Force in a one-shot affair became a drawn-out process. Yet the German recipe of speed, surprise and firepower brought success in the end. Poland's air force remained in the fight until the end of the conflict, although after a week's fighting it had already been significantly reduced. The victory over the Polish air force owed less to the direct actions of the Luftwaffe and more to a combination of attacks upon the enemy's rear and the speed of the German advance. The bombing of Polish communication and their supply system forced the Polish air force to concede the skies by the 6th of September as their supplies ran out while the speed of the German advance destroyed the early warning system and forced the pursuit brigade to spend most of its time hopping from airfield to airfield, abandoning aircraft at every one. Now the final tally of the conflict has some interesting aspects. While Poland loses, by courtesy of the German-Soviet victory, its whole air force, Polish pilots would continue the fight by fleeing to countries, such as the United Kingdom, where they became some of the most decorated aviators of the war. Looking at the German casualties, we can see that 285 aircraft were brought down by the Poles, with about the same number damaged. Of these, roughly 40% were eventually written off. The highest loss rate was amongst the bombers, followed closely by fighters. Of the Stukas, 31 were lost, amounting to just under 10% of the total dive bomber force. For the Luftwaffe, Poland had been a trial by fire, and it now had its proof of concept. Nevertheless, some problems had to be ironed out. The first lesson learned in the Polish campaign by the Wehrmacht senior leaders was the importance of full cooperation of the army and Luftwaffe units. When the Luftwaffe and the army commanders were co-located and worked together, decisive results were achieved. In the Luftwaffe's first assessment of the lessons learned from Poland in October 1939, the Luftwaffe general staff requested improved army Luftwaffe communication links to enhance the cooperation of both services. This, that being the primary tactical element of the Luftwaffe's way of war, was taken very seriously and considerable effort was placed into improving the situation for ground units and pilots alike. This would pay dividends in France and Africa, but especially in the early campaigns against the Soviet Union. Yet, while the Luftwaffe's logistical system had held together in the short, more carefully planned campaign, cracks were beginning to show. Although the Luftwaffe had a considerable number of motorized supply columns and airfield companies for the Polish campaign, units such as the Special Purpose Division still ran low on fuel and munitions at forward airfields. The air transport assets allocated to the Luftwaffe's tactical units had been insufficient. Yet the Luftwaffe failed to take the limitations of a logistics system designed only for short campaigns seriously. That the Luftwaffe, jubilant in victory, did not reflect more strongly on its limitations is perhaps understandable. The failure to do so, however, would hound the force until the last day of the war. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, share it with your friends and check out my Patreon support for more videos like this one. All relevant links, as well as my sources, are, as always, in the description. Make sure to check out MHV's video on Stuka Panzer Corporation. And as always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.